everybody. Welcome everybody to today's seminar on equality for women in science. Uh, before we begin, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri, and pay respects to their elders and family. Robert Wood is professor at the Australian Graduate School of Management at University of New South Wales. He's also director of the Centre for Ethical Leadership here at University of Melbourne and honorary professor at Florey. He completed his PhD in organisational psychology at the University of Washington in Seattle and undertook postdoctoral studies at the Stanford University Psychology Department. Um, since then, his prior appointments, appointments have included being Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Western Australia. Today, he'll be talking about why there are so few women at senior levels in science. Now, this is a particularly timely discussion given recent data that has emerged from a comprehensive study conducted by the Women in Science Parkville Project, or WISP body, which showed clearly that there was a sharp decrease in female represent representations at higher levels in both the research and administrative arms of the institutes around Parkville, including at Florey. So thanks to Jeff, Equus was given the opportunity to present some of this to a recent external review committee, and we're awaiting their thoughts on this, which should be released very soon. But WISP and Equus are using this data to devise strategies that actively work towards achieving equality in science. And some of this work indeed is being carried out in collaboration with the Centre for Ethical Leadership. Information about these strategies, together with some of the results from the data collection project, is soon going to be made available on Nucleus. Um, but in the meantime, Professor Woods is going to speak to some of these issues today. And given his vast expertise in devising and engineering equitable leadership programs, this should be a very promising talk, a very inspiring talk, sorry. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing his thoughts on the matter. So welcome, Professor Woods. I'll hand over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, this talk is not really a, a research talk as such. It's a sort of set of arguments I think are probably important for us to consider and uh, about why there are so few women at the top and uh uh, so, uh, and it's, I'm not wearing a suit because it's, uh, you know, it's a sort of practical thing, it's, the two are unrelated. So, um, that, that tells you how often I wear a suit, the fact that I have to comment on the fact that I'm wearing a suit. <laughs> uh, it's, it's sort of one of those things, whenever I walk in, if I've got a suit on, people in the centre say, what are you doing? What's, you know, like, what's <laughs> going on? Okay, uh, so, I, and really what I've done here is I've just chosen these three topics. Uh, I mean, they're clearly the barriers to women at senior levels are, are manifold, but I've just chosen these three topics, bias, uh, uh, social demands, and inequality as possible explanations, as I said. So it's really about starting a conversation and getting people thinking about it. Um, so uh, the question about why we're here. Now, I, I, I was recently, um, uh, talking to some people actually at WeHi, and th the comment was made uh, by somebody that uh, in the UK now you can't apply for MRC funding unless you have a, a silver rating on Athena Swan. And, uh, and then there was a bit of discussion, the usual, usual sort of misconceptions about Athena Swan, that it's jobs for women and all that sort of stuff. And, and it's really like a quality control system saying, are our systems unbiased? Are they providing equal access and all that sort of stuff? And, um, and somebody said, well, and, and I made the point, you know, no, no, from what I know of it, and this was from talking to people at University of Melbourne, uh, nobody in Australia would qualify for a silver rating at this stage. And, um, uh, and the person, who was sort of a bit of the antagonist in this uh, said, uh, well, it doesn't matter, that's the UK, it's not coming here. And I had to say, well, I think it might be. First of all, I learned it when I was giving a talk to Brian Schmidt and the Academy of Sciences, and they, they were basically of the view, it seems like a good idea, you're right, because, and, and the second reason sort of relates to why we're here. This is a pretty typical diagram. The, the specifics of it don't that ma matter, you know, but, but any broad area, professional services, whatever, you tend to see this sort of picture, and the yellow are the proportions of women, and the, uh, sorry, but, oh, and the grey are the proportions of men. And if we come one level lower, it's typically 50-50. So if it, the postdoc level in the medical research institutes would be, what, about 52% women, pretty much the same as law firms, and they disappear as we get to the top. And, and that's a sort of interesting question, right? Uh, why, well, why should we be worried about this? You know, you can argue social justice, but if you're a government, you look at this, and you say, well, wait a minute, you know, Australia's ranked number one in the OECD for female participation in education. 
This is a, you know, considering we're an immigrant society, that is a pretty good achievement with all language differences. However, we're ranked about 30, between 34 and 37 for female participation in the labour market. Women are underemployed or not employed and the like. And that's as worse in the, the STEM areas than it is in many other areas. And so, and so if you're a government, you look at this and you say, wait a minute, we've got this massive investment in education. You know, so it's like buying you know, 100 machines and saying, well, 20 or 50 of them, we only use half of them and leave them out there. It's, it's one of the reasons why people like Goldman Sachs write articles saying underutilization of women leads, you know, if we, if we fully utilize women at the same levels as some of our competitor countries, uh, we would have 6.4 billion more dollars on the um, a GDP. And it's sort of interesting because when you think about the relativities, you know, all the normal arguments like women have babies and all that sort of stuff uh, don't apply, right? Because they also have babies in other countries, as I understand it. Um, uh, and I know they must have because uh, one of my children was born in another country, yeah, but, but then well, they are Australian. Okay, so, so this point, there's an economic imperative here which governments are not going to let it away, and I can easily see a time in the future where people say, look, we, it's not about you know, jobs for girls or you know, jobs for boys or whatever. It's about better utilization of talent through our systems and processes. Um, the, and I apologize for this slide. Just ignore the detail. Uh, I'll leave the slides here. But this is a, a put together by Catalyst. It's a research group in New York. And basically, it summarizes the research evidence around um, the benefits of diversity. And it's sort of interesting uh, in this, if you go from the top, which is the organizational level, yeah, you know, the data is mainly correlational, it does have lag studies, they, they have sort of quasi-control groups. So it's not the sort of stuff that you would normally do in your lab. But by the time you come down to the bottom, the leadership team, performance, and culture, these are usually pretty good, uh, rigorous, controlled studies uh, uh, of looking at teams. And, and there's a lot of evidence that diversity leads to better problem solving. Now, clearly, if we're locked in a particular paradigm, and it's fit for task and the world is not changing, then, then you know, overlearning that paradigm and applying it time and time again is the way to go. But if you want to be on the frontier, sort of innovation, discovering new things, not you know, have some competitive advantage by being different, then diversity adds uh, to that. But there's a big qualifier, and this comes to the point uh, Christine made about uh, WISP and the uh, leadership program we're planning, which I'll take, and it's this. Uh, you know, uh, diversity can be an asset or a liability. It's a liability when it becomes a source of fault lines. And so I've, I've been in departments, I used to be a deputy vice chancellor, and I've been in departments where uh, you know, there were groups formed around sexual preferences in one of the departments. There were uh, other departments, there were sort of in engineering, there was uh, groups formed around ethnicity and, and they were corrosive. You know, they didn't actively, well, in some cases they did actively sabotage one another, but, but, you know, staff meetings were just bun fights and, you know, the agendas never move forward. So, so diversity can be, a liability. Now, you know, you might say, well, one solution is homogeneity, but, but that has its problems, right? Because it ends up being grouping. So, so we really need inclusive leadership. And I, I mean, a very simple way to think about inclusion is sort of utilizing the talent that you have available. And that really requires two dimensions. One, this dimension of belonging. People need to feel like they belong. They come to work and they're psychological, you know, they're accepted. There's a level of psychological safety. But, but that belonging can't be at the price of their uniqueness. So you often see in mining companies women who are more blokey than the blokes as a way of being accepted. And Australia has this history. I mean, I grew up in a small mining town in central Western Australia, and there was a large immigrant population. And in order to belong, they had to trade off their uniqueness. And they did this by the second generation, you know, people my age, turned their back on their culture. They didn't learn the language. You know, they didn't eat the food. And, and that was because to do that, you ended up being called a wog or whatever. So they turned their back on you know, their parents often and their, and their culture. 
But you know, we don't want that. We want people to be who they are and to draw on that full diversity. And that's, it's only when that happens that you get this um, absorptive capacity is a jargony word, but basically what it means is how quickly do people, teams absorb change. The more homogeneous teams are, the more resistant they are to change. And when there's more diversity, they tend to have different points of view. And they also, there's a lot of research evidence that diverse teams that utilize what broadly can be considered inclusive leadership, that's fully utilizing all the talent and all the diversity in the room, are much more innovative. And there's been lots of studies of uh, scientific research teams like your own. I mean, it's sort of interesting. It's, it's, uh, I was Deputy Vice Chancellor at the U of WA, and this was a big problem. You know, um, I, knew, I kept on wondering how these departments of really intelligent people would just form up views that seemed, well, you know, just not all that rational in terms of things. And, and you start to realize that U of WA, and anybody from WA who's been to the university, I apologize if you find this offensive, but uh, uh, something like about 75, uh, I think about, you know, close to 80% of all the entering graduates from Australia come from a circle that is eight kilometers radius from the center of the, the, and it has to be eight kilometers to take in all the private schools. And so 80%, 75% of all the living graduates in Western Australia live in that same circle. So this is, uh, uh, this is a broader perspective where, you know, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, it doesn't, uh, uh, people can be homogeneous, but, but constantly update their knowledge. It's just that it takes more effort to do that. Fortunately, Western Australia is, uh, I think it has the highest proportion of uh, immigrant English and uh, Asian immigrants, so that, that adds diversity. Though it is interesting to note, if you ever, to go back to my point about belonging and fitting in, quite often, if you look, see the news in Western Australia, if people are arguing against refugees, it's often recent immigrants who are speaking the most strongly, and that's, that's a signal, you know, they're legitimising themselves. Anyway, enough about that. Okay, so when we talk about bias, when we, what is unconscious bias? It, it's just simply a tendency to respond in a particular way. And it, it's unconscious not in the sense that you're asleep, but it's unconscious in the sense that you, uh, you don't consciously control the processes. And, uh, and this applies to a lot of our decision making and values. It, it's often so that optimal because it doesn't take into account the specifics of the situation. I mean, it, you know, people often will argue, oh, well, women, I like this, and then they'll cite their one or two examples. Never, I mean, you should never let a good story uh, be beaten down by you know samples of you know hundreds and hundreds of studies, of course. But um, but but then you know the point is, even if a stereotype was true in the aggregate, it doesn't make it true in the individual case. So so um, if you think about it, in Australia, men on average are taller than women, right? Nobody uh, could refute that. But nobody uses that to imply that every woman is shorter than every man, right? Because we can directly observe it. However, when we get into other judgments like temperament, you know, analytic ability and things like that, the evidence is not so directly available. So our stereotypes and our unconscious biases play a much larger part uh, when the evidence is not you know, immediately uh, valid and uh, irrefutable. And, and of course, the point I'd make, and this is one of the functions of Athena Swan, unconscious knowledge uh, doesn't necessarily mean you have to be biased. It's really a question of how you apply it. Uh, I made the comment earlier that I grew up in a mining town in Western Australia. It was Kalgoorlie. Now, Kalgoorlie is still in the news for the same reasons, but I've said on many occasions, if you were going to design a training program to make a young man sexist and racist, you could not have done better than Kalgoorlie when I was growing up. But, but that's not the person who I am today, right? Because they choose to be different. So you can, but it's largely a function of the systems and processes. And this is one of the functions of Athena Swan, is saying, let's just get more organized. Let's make sure the data don't overwhelm us so that we fall back to our unconscious bias. Now, I mean, many of us in this room are academics, not all of us, but many of us are academics, and we have deep expertise in our area. And that expertise enables us at a quite unconscious level to be very insightful about the specifics. We then make the same 
assumption, we make the assumptions that that capability generalizes to other areas when it doesn't because we don't have the same level of depth of expertise around those things. And let's be clear, you know, that's one of the functions of expertise. It enables you to see patterns and things that other people don't. It enables you to interpret signals which are ambiguous to other people. But that, it's, a, it's not a function of your skill per se, uh, it's a function of your expertise. So when it comes into judging other people, sitting on a selection committee that is poorly organized and biased, uh, it's just not good enough to say, oh, well, I know how to judge people, you know, because unless you've trained in that and are a deep expert, you don't. That's why we have systems and processes like Athena Swan. Okay, so uh, this question about bias, uh, this is a sort of interesting example that illustrates it. And um, let, let me just pause before, I, uh, just to illustrate how, how we, I'm not sure if I have, uh, how we think. Uh, a really simple cognitive psych example is to think of a house that you grew up in. And then the next thing is to work out how many windows are on the house. Now, when that, I don't know what your personal experiences are, but, but most times when you ask people to do that, the image of the house just pops into their mind. And, it's, and that's what we call unconscious thought. You don't control the image. It's typically the front of the house, but it may be somewhere else. Once you have the image, you can manipulate it. But when I, and so that's what they call fast thinking, system one, unconscious thought. When you ask about the windows, you often, as I did here, you see people's eyes start to move and they start counting windows. You know, and often they go from left to right. Occasionally people will look up and so And that's conscious thought. You control it, you make a choice about going from left to right. And uh, it's much slower, imperceptibly so here, slower than the first. But uh, it, the critical point to make, make you aware is that, that Conscious thought is embedded in the unconscious, and that's often what happens. You know, our unconscious understanding or pattern recognition, we then start making our judgments within that context. And of course, if that is initial judgments are biased, and like this, this example, if you can read it as it says, in the US, something like about in the um, Fortune 500, which are the largest companies in the world, something like about 480 of them are men, and 60, close to 60% of them are uh, over six foot. And it turns out that in the population at large, that's about 15%. If you go to over six foot two, then it's around about, what, 30, what does it say? Uh, 30% and 4% are, oh, can I, about 4%. So there's this gross overrepresentation. Now, we reach an interesting point in our thinking. Many of you in this room will be sitting there thinking the counterfactual. You will be thinking about explanations to why this is rational. And they may, I've heard them all, right? Uh, and so I typically go away and test them. One of them is, well, uh, leaders, are, tall men are more likely uh, have more presence. And so, okay, well, yeah, uh, or tall men are more likely to have been captain of sports teams and so therefore more experienced. All of these are quite valid or logical, like not so valid, but logical. But the evidence is there's no relationship between height and leadership effectiveness. Now, people say, well, maybe it's a subsampling problem that uh, your core CEOs, the bias is towards Caucasians, so therefore Caucasians on average have better diets, and, and that's true, but if you, if you look at the height and you add, you add in the, you know, you just separate out the Caucasians, the, the multipliers are not quite as large, but they're about the same. So uh, the point is, most of these explanations, now, I, I use this example to illustrate a couple of points about how unconscious bias works. First of all, I've sat on hundreds, I used to chair the University Promotion Committee, I've sat on hundreds, I've never been in a meeting where somebody said, uh, this person's tall, they'd make a good leader. I've never had a discussion of height. I, I've never seen height as a selection criteria. Apparently it is in certain military roles and others. So these people are not setting out to make this decision, but it, it, Clearly, it's, it's, for some reason, this variable is confounded with other criteria that is going on in their judgment process, and, and it's manifesting itself. And, and the, the point is their implicit theories, which they can justify, happen to be empirically wrong. And so therefore, you need to sort of consciously over... The other point that this illustrates to me is quite often, bias is only evident in the aggregate. You know, I've, you know, as I said, any selection committee I've sat on, and we, have, you know, we typically have to write justifications at the end, there's more than enough data to justify your choice. So if somebody comes up to me and says, look, Bob, I think your judgment processes might have been biased. 
I can very quickly prove to them it's not. It's only when you start to look at the accumulated effects. I mean, there's enough experienced academics in this room to have the experience that I've observed on one occasion where the chairperson was writing up that, and they said, no, 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 it wasn't Jeff, it was Julie that we selected. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> and the justification flows just as easily. So uh, the point is, uh, these you don't notice this in the individual. So when somebody feels that they're being discriminated against, often it falls back to them rather than the committee. Uh, very quickly, does it happen to us? Well, yes, it does. This is a, this is a type of study that's been done to death. Uh, this is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. It's a typical study. They put together a um, uh, CV for a lab manager, same pop, yes, just one CV, and then they make two copies. One has the name Jennifer, one has John. Goes out to all the top lab managers in the US, so that would be people like people in this room, but you know, the, uh, the you know, physics, the astrophysics lab at MIT, or places like Stanford uh, Chemical Labs and that. And what you discover is this. You start to see that just putting the name Jennifer on means she gets the same CV, gets rated as less competent, less hireable, and less likely to be mentored. And then when we get to salary, they're sort of discretionary, you start to see we get a, a different recommendation around salary. Now, when, when people are questioned about this, they clearly will say stuff like, oh, well, you know, it's his experience, he worked with so-and-so and all that. So, um, but of course, it, it's, it's not ha they're not looking at both sides, so they don't have the control group in front of them. So, so if you sit down in a selection process and you have these two CVs side by side, this is not going to happen. So the pro but the process typically doesn't happen like that. You know, we might look at Jennifer on Wednesday and John on the Friday. It turns out this sort of effect, if you put these two CVs in a group of 15 CVs, you know, one at three and one at 14, you get very similar effects. You know, more people actually detect the similarity, but, but most don't because of the way we process things. This, this is called evaluation bias. It's quite interesting. Now, you, I should, yeah, we all know, you can see here that the axis is cut off. It doesn't go all the way to zero, and the, so the standard error bars. So, I, I mean, who knows why that did. It was in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, so I assume the editor said, and they're coloured diagrams, I assume he or she said, look, uh, you've got enough data here to make the point. But look at the results on the, the comments on the blog. Um, so one person says, sadly, these results are disturbing but not surprising. Another person just dismisses everything because of this. Uh, um, uh, um, yeah, but, but, it, no, but it's a good example. It's a, you know, I've been an editor of a leading journal, and it's a good point, right? You often have to say to people, yeah, don't fudge it. We, yeah, so we know that. But, but there's enough data in that, that ex you know, there. You know, the, the, I mean, my criticism, criticism would have been they're using uh, uh, significance tests and traditional statistics, but that's, a, that's another issue. Uh, um, and so, uh, yeah, and so this is a way we defend ourselves. And, you know, very smart people. And we use our expertise in one area to reject change and diversity in another. Okay, now it, this is just an individual study. I just, this is the same example writ large, and this is uh, uh, Anna Janat, one of my PhD students, and, and Anna, um, uh, this is when she had 156 studies. This is the introductory chapter to her PhD. She's run a series of experiments, but, but what you see is uh, the same thing. Sometimes these are done with CVs, sometimes they're done with interviews, and basically the idea is you try and match people as though they're twins almost in terms of physical attractiveness and all that, and, and it's run across a whole variety of methods. And what you find is the female, uh, oh sorry, the, the scale at the top are D statistics. You know, when you do a meta-analysis you convert the R's and the, the F's and the T's into uh, D statistics, and they go from minus one to plus one. Yeah, so these results are all significant except the light blue. And, and so you see the woman gets rated less competent, uh, less desirable as a leader, and less likely to be hired. Now, when people do that, their explanation, I, I want to give you a personal example. Uh, I did my postdoc at Stanford with a, quite a famous psychologist by the name of Al Bandura. And Al and I published quite a bit together. And my former partner, Sally, did her postdoc at uh, Northwestern. She's a statistician with a very famous statistician by the name of Martin Tanner. He was editor of JASA. And she published quite a bit with Martin. And we've had the experience reported back to us where uh, Sally, people look at Sally's record and say, yeah, I mean, she worked with Martin Tanner. Who wouldn't get published in JASA working with Martin Tanner? 
People look at my record, and I've had people say to me, you work with Al Bandura, sort of implying, how good must you be? So it's, it's sort of, you know, we, we, we take the same data and we interpret it differently. We have different diagnostic judgments or different predictive judgments. And so even when the evaluations are sort of the same. Now, one would hope if the evaluations are side by side, then, but even, I've sat on promotion committees where I've seen that, where people bring out different interpretations. So it's just not the hard data. And the, this is called evaluation bias. Now, people have sort of been, in, and this is basically because the stereotype of the role matches the male and not the female, and we tend to reward, you know, the efficiency of, you know, conforming to stereotypes. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, what happens if a woman behaves in a different way. If she's assertive and says, you know, uses the personal pronoun I a bit more or disagrees in public, do you think she gets rewarded and selected? So this is, in these studies, this is where a person's being interviewed and they say, well, look, I did this. I, I went in and I restructured the team or they write it in their uh, CV. This is what happens, right? Assertive women who run counter stereotypical. Interestingly, because they're back, you know, they're defying the female stereotype, they get rated as more competent. You know, she's different, type of thing. But as you can see, she doesn't get hired. And she doesn't get hired for two mediating reasons. One is she's seen as confrontational, and second, she's seen as likable. You know, would you want to work with her? And this is sort of interesting. Uh, in the military, uh, um, uh, under Liz Broderick's thing, people have stopped using the word fit because fit was a way of saying we're not going to select her. Uh, they people use the the fit word, and uh, and I, while I there's a big push now about civil work workforces and all that, which I think are very important things. But there's a yeah you know, there's a dark side here because yeah you know, people start to in, in uh, define the concept very loosely, and so this concept of fit which everybody thought was a great thing, is, is a lever that you can use to get rid of people who are different. You, know, you don't like their uniqueness. So, uh, I'm, and look, I'm not suggesting that we hire people who are totally obnoxious. So I think if, if, you're, if, if there's any place we should be doing that, I think it's in academia. Uh, and the world is, when I was a deputy vice chancellor, people, I regularly would have people burst into my office and tell me I was ruining the university and as soon as I got out of this chair, the better it would be. And, and then they'd leave, and I, I think now they'd probably be carted off to jail or something, but those were the, the good old days. And that's the sort of the, uh, the uniqueness part of it. So, okay, um, and I just want to very quickly tell you a, just the impact of this. I was talking to a law firm, this is going back a long time, and I finished the talk, and I'd mentioned this back, this is called Backlash. And um, a woman was sitting about where Julie is, and she was sitting there quietly, everybody gone. And I walked over and I said, is everything OK? And she said, you know, when you were describing that backlash, you were describing my experience here. And I said, wow. And she said, yeah. In fact, it's got so bad that my kids have said, mum, when you come home, don't talk about work and stop drinking so much. And she said, you know, it's really, and, and, I, and at that point I said, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't introduced you. And, I, and she told me her name, and I almost went, oh, you're that person. Because everybody had told me about, oh, Julie's in your cell, <laughs> watch out. Yeah, so it's this stereotype. And we, we chatted about it, and she said, you know, if I try and change my persona, people get suspicious. And that's very common about stereotypes. One of the safest places to be, even if it's a totally uncomfortable place, is to conform to your stereotype. Otherwise, you're seen as uppity, or you're seen as untrustworthy, or you know, what, what's she trying to get? It's like me turning up in a suit. Yeah, what, <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah, so. OK. So, so when we talk about, and I'm going to leave these slides. So, like, yeah, there are many types of bias, but one of the, you know, a lot of the bias is just content bias. It's it's stereotypes and knowledge that we have stored in long-term memory, and so I've said stereotyping and the like. Uh, a big one is availability, and and uh, you know, th uh, this should be less of a risk in um, universities because yeah, you know, we go to conferences. We're constantly, you know, availability is just when you you use the information that's immediately available in your environment. And and you know, and over time, if we work in groups, we tend to f develop common interests. We share knowledge and stuff. And that's that's great as long as it's fit for tasks. But if it's not, then uh, you know we we can miss the boat. Yeah, you know, the world changes. And I've seen this in a lot of paradigms in psychology over the years. And um, and, and you know, for many years, it was a big problem in Australian universities. You know, this institute was an exception, but in many universities, people did their PhD in the department, they stayed there, they taught, and they grew up, and they were off the frontier. I remember when I was doing my PhD and my postdoc, I'd often be asked to look at PhDs from Australia, and they would be 
technically expert, but the question was so far from the frontier, and it was because you know the local knowledge base wasn't yeah you know, it wasn't turning over, it wasn't exposed, and so it wasn't challenging itself, and so the whole status hierarchy was tied up to that. And and I've been head of departments. Uh, when I first came back to Australia, where that's been a major issue. You know, people who defend themselves through their technical capability because their knowledge is no longer on the frontier. Okay, uh, and so, you know, the basic point is, of course, if we, um, it doesn't matter if we have misconceptions, right? If we test them and if we have a rigorous environment, we ask counterfactuals and the like. But we often do, it sort of intrigues me. Uh, you know, we, we've, as academics, we're really good, and people who work in the academic environment, you know, we're good at asking counterfactuals and challenging things in our domain, but when we move out of our domain, we often aren't so good. And I mean, a really interesting piece of research, if, if, um, if I say to you, well, I'm about, you're about to interview Jeff for a job, and I say, you might say, what's Jeff like? And I say, well, he's relatively quite a bit introverted. Interestingly, it, whether you're an academic or not, you're more likely to ask the question of Jeff, are you a quiet person? Basically, what you're seeking to do is confirm your hypothesis. This is happening. You, know, you can give people hypotheses and they ask questions seeking confirmation. And Jeff might on average say yes. And then it passes in the interview. And at the end of the interview, we say, oh, he's great technically, but I don't think he could handle the people side of it. Because you know, as you know, he's a quiet person. Whereas if you'd ask a counterfactual, which is, Jeff, I've got this hypothesis, he's quiet. Could you describe a, you know, a time when you're outgoing or you know, extrovert? And he might say, oh, when I'm working with people in this domain, I am. But, but it's these very subtle effects. So our processing is often driven towards confirmatory biases. And um, you know, I, I, when I was an editor of a journal, I used to see this. You know, people uh, would basically try and rewrite the requirements of a paper, paper to fit the methods that they preferred. You know, so when they were reading it, they couldn't quite see what was good about this study because it wasn't fitting you know, their particular method. Um, and, and so you know, one, one of the things you have to do as an editor is annoy your reviewers. And, uh, but uh, but it's this very strong confirmatory bias that comes through all the time. And, and of course, this, one of the things that I've observed, not in this institute, but in others, is very strong affinity bias. And there's a very maleness about it that people, you know, and it's people don't recognize. It's this shared interest, this common interest over time. There's a sort of a natural, you know, if you support uh, uh, you know, football teams or, you know, do certain things. You know, and, and, and that, it's not as though, people tend to think, oh, that's just that. But it's not just that. It's that and all your other interests and how you interact to other people. I'm just sensitive to time, so I'm, as I said, I'll leave this. Uh, let me just... Uh, the, these are just very quickly some strategies. I don't want to focus on these today. Let me uh, just skip over. Uh, and um, so that's the bias part. You know, so what I've tried to do is give you evidence of bias. Uh, I'll leave the slides, and if you're interested, you can read about the strategies. But in the interest of time, I just now very quickly want to talk about social demands. You know, in every part of the world, women spend more time on unpaid, on unpaid work than men. And, um, and that means they bear a much, on average, once again, they bear a much larger burden of uh, work, family conflict, uh, competing demands, all sorts of stuff, right? And, and it's only one of the reasons we slip down the rankings when it comes to female participation in lab, labor is we just don't have a sophisticated uh, flexibility, work flexibility laws, uh, tolerance of workplace flexibility, our childcare facilities. And so those things, and they, they add into the complexity of work. Now, we, we have attempted in Australia to deal with this through performance relative to opportunity. Now, uh, as a person who sat on many ARC panels and chaired many um, um, promotion committees, one, one of the things I realize as academics, we confound total output with productivity. Productivity is output per unit of input, right? And so it, when I was DVC at U of WA, Alan Robson, who came in after me, was on the promotions committee. And we set up a system where uh, if, say, for example, uh, you had been a woman or anybody had been off to, you know, so you graduated 10 years ago, and let's say the woman had, uh, let's say, 20 publications, and the man had graduated 10 years ago, and let's say had uh, uh, 25, okay? 
Uh, then what we would do, long before any conversation, we would sit down and say, what's the performance relative to opportunity? So let's, let, for sim the simple maths, let's assume the woman had been off on, for five years on maternity leave. That meant her average, her productivity was four publications per year. If the man had worked the 10 years, his productivity was 2.5 publications per year. We put that data in front of the committees. And, and, and looked at the rankings. And of course, the rankings change. If you're looking at 25 publications versus 20, you start to say, oh, this person's more pr productive. But they're not. They just have total output. And Alan Robson, who was a most wonderful leader, made a really good point. He said, give me somebody who's gone off, had a couple of kids, run her life, come back, and still managed to crank out you know, 20 publications over five years. That, uh, because the best predictor of future productivity is past productivity, not total output past productivity, which is inputs per unit. So, uh, and so one of the points always is that re performance relative opportunity needs to be assessed before you start any conversation. And uh, sitting on ARC panels, I mean, I, you see some of them, you know, I had an ingrown toenail, and so I was off for two, you know, people are, are gaming the real, you know, so I think we need harder rules about what, the, what is uh, countable. Um, the other point I make is a lot of people have a misconception about flexibility. Flexible workers are more productive. <laughs> That's, uh, they set more deadlines, they're much more targeted, they're equally loyal and committed to their career, but, but the unconscious assumption is that they're not. There's a, if you go on our website, there's a meta-analysis of meta-analyses about this, and it is, um, it's overwhelmingly uh, the case that uh, people are more productive when they work flexibly. Uh, uh, and so what you start to see here is the time spent on, so people spend about the same amount of work. This is now from ABS, this is Australia. But, but for men, it's more time on paid work means career, getting ahead, being successful. Women spend more time on unpaid work. And even full-time workers, you know, let's be clear, um, Anna Jeanette, the uh, student who did the PhD, went once just for a, a lark, I uh, called around about 25 schools in Melbourne and asked them, you know, who would you call if a child was sick? And I have to tell you, very few said the father. Uh, very few said the father. And, they, and some would say, if the father was listed first, we would call him or her. But, but there's this sort of presumption that uh, they'll call the mother. And so, you know, women take a disproportionate amount of uh, care. Um, and this is sort of, this is, uh, this statistic, this is once again from the Bureau of Stats. And uh, it's sort of interesting, you know, because what you see here is that um, the time, the time that uh, males and females spend on household, it's, well, you can see it peaks in the, you know, the, about the 24 to about 35. And, and why do you think that is? Well, it's, you know, when people have children. But it's also a time when the career potentially takes off. And, and the question, this is just a fact of a structure. So the question, and, and let's be clear, everybody in this room, male, female, has, there's been a massive investment in you. You're, you know, and let's assume they're equally committed. If this is a fact of life, and all of us are on one side or the other of this equation or a, a homosexual relationship, it doesn't matter, they, you, you get the same sorts of splits. The question becomes, well, do we own the total problem? Or is that, you know, we just do our work and that's a societal problem, but we're part of the society. So this is a sort of interesting, when you see that, you start to realise why people start saying, don't have a child until you're about 40, or, you know, take, or have it when you're, you know, you do the cowgirly thing, have it when you're 18, <laughs> before you start university, or, and sometimes before you finish high school, right? Uh, I tell you what, uh, you laugh about that, but I have uh, many friends I grew up with in that position, uh, th th I have to say, it's not to be uh, sneezed, uh, sneered at. It's uh, they've got on very nicely, right? And their kids have left. In anyway, another time. <laughs> okay, so so there are very heavy costs to women, right, around this, and these costs come out in these unconscious processes. We see them. And first of all, the work-family conflict. There is no doubt that work-family conflict, when you measure it, it's disproportionately high in women relative to men, and, and it has a really serious impact on effectiveness, promotion, and stuff like that. It, it also just generates really strong negative stereotypes and misconceptions. So you know, people are committed to children, so they're not committed to their career and all that sort of stuff. It's going to be interesting, you know, in Norway, many of you will know right now, 
in order to get uh, carer's leave, um, you have to take paternity leave as well as maternity leave. I don't. I, I think it's four to two, you know, four months or two or you know, whatever. And if you don't, if the husband doesn't take or whoever, you know, one, both partners in the relationship don't take leave, then you don't get it. And and there's a lot of research going on now, seeing what happens. But the early evidence is it to totally restructures male thinking about you know the roles and stuff. And you know, two to three months, not quite long enough to establish a lifelong habit, uh, but time enough to learn how to operate the washing machine and the dishwasher and, uh, and uh, cook. Uh, uh, so, uh, and so these negative stereotypes go up because of this very, and we do a lot of research on unconscious knowledge, and there are very strong stereotypes that associate women with domesticity and men not. And of course, the fact is if the women are not in the workplace then this male affinity bias grows up and it gets stronger. And so the arguments um, that, you know, I don't, it's sort of interesting, you know, the uh, math school here has uh, advertised a professorial appointment, which only women can apply for. And it's quite, it's like when I uh, talk about quotas, you know, it takes about two sentences for people to start talking about merit. And we, we, I'm happy to talk about why that may be a misapplication. But, but in the case that I have friends in math, um, uh, yeah, so some people say, well, you know, one of them said, you know, so Bob, so what, should we just go out onto Royal Parade and grab a woman and say, come in here and teach advanced calculus? And one has to resist the temptation to say, why not? No, but no, that's, um, uh, uh, but, but then other people say, well, no, and this is it. We have to do things different. We have to search differently. And when, when I was at UFWA, one of the requirements uh, Alan Robson introduced was, if, whenever you, a, a level D or E position came up, yeah, somebody left. In order to get the funding back, you had to put forward a list of potential candidates that included men and women. You had to do a proactive search. Who are the good people out there? Because one of the ways our unconscious bias works through this affinity is when we start thinking about it in a reactive way, we go to our networks. And if our networks are all predominantly men, then that's who we think of. But so quite often it requires a conscious search process. And it's interesting, a couple of law firms and an accounting firm have spoken to about this, now actively search and have lists of all the women in Australian professional services firms that they would recruit. Because they know if, if they start looking for what they call laterals, then all the examples that will come up will be men, unless you go out and find the others. OK, so finally, uh, inequality. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes. You know, basically, uh, women are underpaid relative to men. Uh, as you can see, they, um, and there's lots of statistics here that, that support, yeah, they're much more likely to suffer from domestic violence. I mean, that's 99.5 to 0.05. And let's be clear, you know, the level of domestic violence in society, if you believe Liz Broderick's uh, research, is um, it touches all socioeconomic groups. There's people in this room who may have been victims of domestic violence or perpetrators of it. So let's not kid ourselves about this. And it takes on many different forms. Uh, they, they're more likely to care. So now, I just want to make this point, because now it brings us back to another body of research. One of my uh, postdocs, um, Boyka bratton um has done a series of studies looking at uh, inequality. And in this research, it's not around women per se, but it's you take you know, normal sort of middle class uh, university students and you take them into an experimental condition and you manipulate their feelings of equality or inequality uh, in that, that setting. I, the, I won't go into the research paradigm, but I'm happy to talk about it. And what you very quickly discover, and you know, there's about five or six studies published in different places here, is that people Expo and, and what Boyka does is she measures their calorie intake earlier in the day and, and all that and their socioeconomic controlling for all those factors. Basically, people who walk out of the experiment and are waiting in a waiting room, there's food left there for them and there's, you know, there's the healthy food and the high calorie. They basically consume many more calories and they go for comfort food. And what we know from Boyka's research is it basically there's a low level of social anxiety that's, that's uh, pronounced by, uh, sorry, it's created by feelings of inequality. And so you see this and people who speak too loud or react in different ways. And, and it's sort of, it's an interesting phenomena. Um, uh, and I think it's one of the big questions in our society. You know, do we respect people's uniqueness? Do we respect, or do, does it make them feel sort of lesser, you know, uh, by you know, just 
asides or remarks on that. And I, I just want to close now on this. So there's an interesting example of inequality in uh, remote mining sites. So one of my PhD students did a study for a company, and it, it wasn't a really you know, rigorous experiment study, but basically they discovered that they were getting much more lost time injuries from women than from men. And so they interviewed people and basically the view was, well, yeah, it's not women's work and you know, they're not fitted here. And so um, uh, Michelle went in and did a fairly systematic survey and, and stuff. And basically what came out was on this website, you know, they, ha they had a fantastic record. There was no sexual harassment or you know, the normal stuff and the drinking thing was all under control. But what there was was this low level of sexism. You know, simple jokes like, yeah, it's not a women's work or, or whatever. Or, yeah, and, and basically what happens in this situation is this low-level social anxiety comes out in the form of rumination, where people thinking, oh, I should have said this or I should have said that or whatever. And if you're ruminating in a high-risk environment, you're at risk, right? Because high-risk environments require attention. And so, so they've now instituted this no just joking policy. So the idea would be if I made a sort of a sort of sexist remark to Julie and she said, Bob, I don't like that, what I would typically do is say, just joking. I'm just joking. And I will, it's no bad intention. But that then lead, that isolates Julie. And so there's Victor Sojo, some work on this. And, and what happens is when somebody, or Jeff comes to her and says, she says, oh, I didn't like what Bob said. He says, oh, stop banging on about it. Yeah, it was just a joke, right? And what happens is she, it's a double whammy. She's insulted the first time, and then she feels like she lacks a sense of humor. And uh, i just close on a, so this, this sort of idea of inequality can take many, many dimensions. So just, this just joking is a risky thing, and I've seen it on, in one of the other institutes. i just close on a personal story and then take questions. When I went to Stanford to do my postdoc, I was sort of in awe of the place. You know, I mean, I'd published some papers, and you know, Elbender was a sort of big name. And uh, anyway, uh, I'd only been there a couple of days, and they had a function with all the faculty, with um, uh, you know, postdocs and new PhD students in the faculty. And there was a, not Al, but another professor there came up to me, and somebody said I was from Australia. And he said, oh. his first question to me was, was your grandmother a prostitute? And I was like, whoa. And so uh, it turns out, I read later, he'd read Robert Hughes' book, The Fatal Shore, so he was sort of trying to be funny. But I had this most perfect comeback. I, I mean, it was out outstanding. I said, you've got it wrong. We're a penal colony, not a penile colony. <laughs> Unfortunately, I only thought of that next day. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I spent a lot of time between there and then wondering what I should have said and you know, sort of questioning my position. So, so we all can roommate and inequality is a, a, if people are not respected for their individuality, then rumination is a debilitating uh, process. We've all suffered it. I mean, you, we all do a bit of it after we get an editor's letter suggesting that maybe this is not a publishable paper, right? So, okay, so thank you very much. So let me ch close there. Thanks, Bob. That was absolutely terrific. You've got me ruminating. <laughs> uh